Hi, and welcome to our live webinar today, where we're going to be asking our expert panel, does HPC need a data center? My name is Maz Lopez, and I'm head of marketing for Boston Limited, and I'm delighted to be joined today by marketing manager for Asperitas, Michael Borisius, and Boston's head of enterprise solutions group, Taylor DeKine. In today's webinar, we're going to be learning about the HPC solution process and how traditionally this has led to the conventional data center cluster setup, but perhaps there is another way. There's going to be a Q&A session at the end, so please submit your questions now via the Q&A tool. That's the icon that's in the top right of your screen, or you can always email marketing.promotions at boston.co.uk if you're happier with that. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Taylor, Head of Enterprise Solutions Group um, for Boston. Thanks, Maz. Um, really a pleasure to be on today's web webinar. I hope everyone is enjoying uh, the wonderful heat wave that the UK is experiencing at the moment. Um, Michael, if you have any spare uh, full immersion units uh, handy at the office, please send them to my house. It is absolutely uh, boiling out there. Otherwise, the, the kiddie pool out front might just have to suffice. Anyway, I hope everyone's staying cool. So is is H, shall we say, is uh, is immersion cooling a game changer for HPC? We believe it is. And today's presentation will tell you a little bit about Boston, who we are, our relationship with uh, Asperitas, and the partnership that we've built over, over the years. And we'll talk you through um, what our HPC practice looks like, how we approach HPC, how we approach immersion and cooling solutions for HPC. And then Michael will walk us through the Asperitas product and the Asperitas uh, proposition and how they view the world of high performance computing. So a little bit about Boston. Um, Boston was founded in 1992. We've been in business um, right around 30 years with a real focus on introduced leading and cutting edge technologies uh, to our kind of channel and, and enterprise customers across the globe. We're headquartered in uh, the UK here in St. Albans, and we have a team that uh, uh, spreads across the globe and focus on various, various different solution areas. So Boston and Asperitas have been working together for quite a few years, as I mentioned, and we've been providing kind of joint solutions together um, to large HPC and enterprise uh, clients. Early on since uh, Asperitas launched in 2014, we identified them as a, a real up and coming leader uh, in the liquid cooling industry. Um, their solutions really impressed us and they were leading the market in terms of the, the cooling metrics uh, that they were able to achieve uh, with their with their solution. Since then, our, our technical, com technical and commercial teams have been working together to bring to market both compute um, and storage solutions that have the capability uh, to be fully, fully immersed. And overall, the, the, uh, the technology has been highly complementary to uh, Boston's HPC practice. So Boston's been acquiring um, over the last kind of three decades significant amounts of experience uh, in various different solutions areas and and high performance computing's uh, been a significant theme for us over over the years and um, we've been uh, acquiring uh, lots of different uh, experience along the way as we've been delivering projects um, and increasing our capabilities in various different solution areas and nurturing various subject matter experts um, that have been working with our customers and our internal teams as we kind of deliver kind of large scale HPC projects. And um, we've also engaged with a variety of technology leaders in the market that we have deployed um, in various customer projects, uh, which has really allowed us to become a leader um, in terms of our reputation in the HPC marketplace. 
our client base uh, really has varied quite a bit over the over the years. It spans from education, um, manufacturing, oil and gas, finance, um, aer aerospace, as you can as you can see. But one one customer I want to kind of just focus on for a moment is CERN. Um, we've been engaging with them since you know 2008, and over the years we've installed over 50 petabytes of storage and over 100,000 x86 cores in various different projects along the way, and delivered some very uh, large, significant projects for them um, in some very very tight uh, deadline times. So, what lies behind all of this within within Boston? How how does our HPC practice function? How is it structured? Um, we really break these uh, this structure kind of out in a few in a few key areas, and really starting with a design and engineering uh, phase where we sit down with the clients and understand what their requirements are, help them to design and, and engineer uh, a solution right from the ground floor, and also keeping in mind what is their their end goal. Um, in terms of other dependencies and elements of the solution that we would take, need to take into consideration, which I'll go into a bit more detail later. Um, all the way through to our build and integration and testing and validation, which are all critical parts of any solution that we build for clients. So for every client that engages with us uh, within the RHPC practice, we, we take them through a pretty uh, regimented and comprehensive uh, solution process. And really that starts with identifying the business outcome that they are looking to achieve. And then once we understand what they're looking to achieve as a business and what their business goals are and, and areas such as budget, we can then move on to you know the more technical aspects uh, of the of the solution, right through to um, really the full life cycle of, of the solution that they will be like like to receive, uh, which includes you know evaluation delivery, and that support of that of that solution. So during this process, we are, shall we say, hand holding our, the customers, and helping them understand. The various technologies that are available to them, um, both from a cloud perspective as well as your storage compute products that are readily available in the market, and obviously today's webinar is very much is, is all centered around kind of the cooling aspect of of shall we say a solution. So helping them understand what are, what are the product products that are readily available on the market to be able to drive. Uh, energy costs down and drive the PoE down in the, in the data center. So the various HPC cooling technologies that you know we all uh, know that are present on on the market, right? Um, are you know your typical standard air cooling, which has been around for for decades, and you know there's been some other technologies that have been introduced in terms of direct to chip tech, water technologies, and but now. Um, full immersion has been around for a fair few years, and it's now emerging as really the leader uh, in the uh, liquid cooling space as it is able to um, drive, shall we say, better metrics and better cost efficiencies and, and savings uh, within HPC environments. One of the key areas that um, we look at as, a, as an industry, and one of the key metrics that we look at is the IT energy consumption, which consumes the most out of the, the data center budget. And the cost per IT watt is, is a particular interest when looking at an HBC environment. And, you know, full immersion cooling really does, a, does, shall we say, the best job in driving down that, that cost. And Michael will go into a bit more detail um, in, later on in the, in the presentation in terms of how they do that. But before we transition over to um, Michael's presentation, some of the key drivers that we've identified through all of our uh, customer engagements, um, once we've identified that they are uh, looking at full immersion and they want to look at liquid cooling technologies, is that you know the TDP that 
our TDP is increasing from both AMD and Intel as they bring the next generation of CPUs to market. Um, the drive for more density in both storage solutions and compute solutions continues to accelerate. Energy costs you know, are not are not going down in the market and the drive to reduce data centers dependency on the energy grids is also increasing. And of course, the ultimate metric, which is that PUE, right? How can we find more creative ways to drive that PUE down? And, and finally, one of the most interesting emerging use cases for full immersion is that reuse of, of the energy that, that the full immersion units emit. How can we repurpose uh, the, the air that the hot air that comes out of these units? And how could we potentially bring that into um, you know, centralized data center deployments, but also edge deployments of data centers? How could cities repurpose that, that energy? How could data center providers repurpose that energy uh, to drive uh, greener um, technologies and, and greener implementations of data centers? So with that, I want to transition over to uh, Michael from uh, Asperitas, who's going to help us understand the Asperitas product in a bit more detail. And we'll have definitely have question, time for questions at the end, uh, and we can circle back. Michael, over to you. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Taylor. And um, I'll be sharing my screen one moment. Um, go. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Uh, thanks for everyone uh, for joining this session, and thanks uh, Taylor and Maas for inviting me uh, to join the session as well and uh, talk a little bit about our technology and the collaboration, of course, and the opportunity uh, we're presenting here today to see if actually it's possible uh, to run the HPC um, environment without a data center. And um, I will get into that a little bit uh, later on. Uh, just quickly for the people who are not uh, familiar with Asperitas, um, we're a clean and high tech company from the Netherlands and have brought an, uh, quite a unique immersion cooling technology to the market in uh, 2017. Um, and we have a very clear mission. Um, yeah, what we would like to achieve is the same efficiency, uh, sustainability and performance uh, for data centers anywhere and of any scale. Um, so everything we do adds up to that mission we have. So um, picking up where uh, where Taylor left me actually with uh, with the different drivers for immersion cooling. Um, if we would like to categorize them in a few uh, main categories, um, we see for HPC, but as well for other uh, adopters of immersion cooling uh, technology solutions like ours. Um, then I think there are three groups, um, and the first one is about the performance, and I think especially related to HPC, of course, this is number one. Um, and performance, with that I mean the increase indeed of the TDBs um, per, um, uh, for next generations uh, uh, semiconductor and GPUs and hardware in general, but uh, especially the combination uh, of the requirement to run end high densities um, on every level, so uh, density in the server, in the rack and in the facility, and that combined with the continuous uh, requirement to run on high performance, um, is a real challenge to do that in traditional data centers, right? And then the second element is um, how we are used to design, build, um, and operate data centers as a facility. Um, they're quite complex to build already, especially in regions uh, outside of the free cooling areas, um, so especially the Nordic European countries. Um, and uh, the main challenge I see is that um, we, what we need to enable is efficiency um, anywhere, um, independent of the region where it's located or the facility itself. Um, and then the last one is, uh, is where Taylor as well um, uh, mentioned a little bit on is the sustainability angle. So from, uh, from an energy efficiency perspective, that has been the main topic um, as well within HPC or as well as in, in the data center industry as a whole. Um, by measuring the PUE and uh, monitoring it and as a benchmark to others. Um, but what we see now is an overall ambition um, to address sustainability from a more holistic point of view. Um, and um, this has been addressed in, uh, in policies and agendas of regions and cities and public organizations and large enterprises. And what we really see is um, we need to be able to facilitate the performance in an efficient uh, facility, but as well to address um, and to um, involve other topics of sustainability like uh, circular approaches and 
uh, and methods, um, and especially heat reuse, which I'll come back to later on. So looking at the technology we have developed, uh, some of you might have seen immersion cooling technologies in the past, um, maybe have used them already. Um, what we have introduced to the market within the immersion cooling category is, an, is a solution that uh, is not using any forced uh, means of circulation. Um, so of course we make use of a dielectric fluid um, and we immerse all the hardware, but in our case we use natural convection uh, to drive the circulation within the system. And the dielectric fluid, um, a synthetic fluid, is never leaving the system as well. And that leaves us with a system from a product point of view, which is really reliable and uh, predictable as well. Uh, without any pumps, um, there, there are very little elements, um, actually none that are making any noise or moving around. Um, so allowing for a low maintenance system with uh, practically no overhead energy as well. Um, but the natural convection bit has two other elements to it, which I'll come back uh, later on as well, which are really, I would say, game changing in this case. Um, we designed the solution in such a way um, that we can use this as a standalone solution, um, practically plug and play, um, up to um, yeah, staking them in a modular way to a large scale, even hyperscale environment. Um, and I think this is, uh, this is making it very suitable to think outside of the box and as well think about other ways of uh, deployment of uh, HPC outside of the data center. Um, on the right side, you see a little bit of a uh, few of the elements we integrated because uh, we think that's needed to uh, comply as well to the highest standards of data centers uh, we see uh, on an enterprise level and then monitoring and control is key. Um, how we do that, I will come back as well later on. The solution itself is designed in such a way that uh, a data center can uh, can be as clean as, as we know them, as well with immersion cooling, um, and we contain a lot of capabilities within the system. So it's a fully contained system uh, and closed as well, um, so that allows for, again, a standalone system um, without a data center. Then there are the two elements which are uh, driven really by the natural convection aspect. Um, you can imagine if you have a forced circulation of the fluid within the immersion cooling system, what you'll get is, is a lower average temperature um, of the bath, let's say. In our case, um, to describe it in a little bit an abstract way, we build layers within, uh, within the system of different temperatures. Um, and this allows us to, uh, to standardize each solution uh, we bring to the market for warm water cooling. Um, so, in other words, climate independency as well in hot climates, um, even up to 45 degrees Celsius ambient temperatures. Um, so, we are expanding the free cooling zone for data centers, let's say. Um, the other aspect is that uh, based on uh, 45 degrees Celsius uh, in that temperature for cooling, um, we, we enable data centers to supply their surroundings with 55 degrees Celsius. Uh, hot water, um, not even air, so it's easy to transport. So yeah, this is a benefit, a dire consequence of how we circulate the fluid within. Um, as well, I would like to point out that the fluid we, we use in our technology, in our lab as well, and as well in, um, in collaborations with OEMs uh, for certifying hardware, uh, we make use of our partnership with Shell. Um, we have developed a, a tailored and a designed for this purpose uh, immersion cooling fluid um, produced by a shell unique process of a gas to liquid process, a synthetic fluid. Um, and all of the information, of course, uh, is available. Um, our solution uh, proposition is actually very simple. We have two main solutions. Uh, we have a smaller system, the original system we launched in, in 2017, uh, which allows uh, for a physical um, setup of 15 inch wide surface, uh, 24 one new surface in total. This solution is great for on site high performance computing, edge computing, uh, where it's more about the performance, um, not so much about the density within a one new server. Um, if the density is the main ambition, then we also have a larger scale setup, um, which is 21 inch ready. Um, so also uh, ready for OCP servers, um, but as well, this is a system that allows for hyperscale deployments, a lot of compute uh, with a minimal space. Um, so very similar uh, solutions, uh, same core technology and capabilities, uh, but um, yeah, uh, different physical space within. So uh, coming back to the monitoring aspect, which uh, is very important uh, within the, the, the presentation we're giving here today, um, what if you don't run your HPC in, an, uh, in a data center? Um, then the, the behavior of the system itself is, of course, uh, key. 
Um, and uh, some people call the solution we offer a data center in a box solution, combining several capabilities of our data center in one contained solution. Um, and this allows us to think about concepts that perhaps do not require uh, you to have a data center or build one for your next generation HPC. Um, so for this reason, we integrated uh, our solution with a, manage a management and a monitoring platform uh, based on all the sensors uh, within our core technology uh, measuring uh, water flow, temperatures, uh, fluid levels, uh, power inlets, um, etc. Um, and if required, we can also make use of the sensors within the IT uh, parts to monitor uh, real time the behavior and um, the fluid temperatures within the system as well, which you see on the left side. So where you normally would monitor the behavior of the room to maintain temperatures for immersion, it's really important to be aware of the real time uh, behavior of the system within, of course. So uh, a little bit about the impact then of our technology. Um, yeah, very briefly, we mentioned already some benefits, but um, it covers uh, a whole lot from energy efficiency, energy reuse, uh, force space reduction, performance. We can run um, HPC full time on full performance. Um, but uh, to point on one specifically on uh, on uh, the dimensions we need in terms of a facility on the left side, you see uh, a, a typical one megawatt data center. Um, quite average actually uh, on traditional technology um, and then you see the comparison uh, what would happen with this facility requirement in terms of floor space and height and as well um, uh, overhead energy and infrastructure for it to support the facility on the right hand. Um, so it's a huge impact. So we can practically do the same uh, job in terms of compute on one fifth of the space in most cases. So again, this allows for looking very different um, at uh, a data center as a facility. Um, there's one misconception on immersion cooling. I would like to uh, make use of the opportunity to take that away. And that's that immersion cooling is only a feasible business case for uh, extreme high density environments. Um, and, um, and then that's just some, simply not the case, as you can see in the graph on the right hand, uh, where we show the, the impact, the potential impact of the capital investment required to build a data center uh, for this purpose and as well um, the operational costs you will have. Uh, you will see that from uh, even a six kilowatt track density, which yeah, is, I would say even on the low end for HPC, uh, immersion cooling is, is really uh, a really good case already and, and changing actually um, the impact on your budget. Um, so allowing you to focus your budget on compute and not the facility um, uh, specifically. So uh, yeah, getting into the topic of how we uh, perhaps can eliminate uh, the data center as a facility. Um, if we look at high performance computing, um, what makes a data center for that purpose actually a data center? Um, it's a little bit different than a co-location provider where connectivity is key, of course, to peer with other data centers. And uh, um, yeah, with HPC, it might be different, right? Um, so I think it's all about compute, facilitating the compute. And this is really the main purpose for the investments you are making um, to run the jobs you want to run on the performance you want to have it on. Um, and then you probably need a facility to, to house it in. Um, which consists um, of two main parts, um, the cooling aspect to, uh, to make sure that your compute is, uh, is safe, reliable and performs well. And then there is the building. Um, and this all leads up to an energy footprint, which is measurable and, uh, and significant in most cases, um, consisting of the electricity consumption of your compute and the facility uh, combined. Um, and then there's a lot of heat generated, which is usually being wasted. Um, so, what can we take away if we would uh, rethink that model on immersion? Um, there are a few elements that definitely we can take away. The, the facility we can uh, we can minimize, or as well uh, we can think about other setups. I will get into that. Uh, we uh, we reduce the cooling requirements to the bare minimum. As I said, we can cool. Um, with ambient temperatures 45 degrees Celsius, so that allows you with free cooling in most regions, um, running on dry coolers if that's required, really uh, reducing the cooling requirement with 95% or so. Uh, the building itself becomes definitely less complex and advanced in terms of what we need to run uh, immersion cooling systems and, uh, and the IT in it. What we need are interfaces to uh, a water supply uh, for cooling, uh, doesn't need to be chilled water, uh, we need, of course, uh, space and power um, and in some cases connectivity, right? Um, that's it, actually. Our requirements for the room itself are, are the bare minimum, uh, which I'll show you later on. 
from an electricity point of view, um, there are definitely reductions made on the IT side. We don't use any fans. Um, so uh, that, that's one we can be much more efficient on that side. And of course, uh, we reduce the footprint on the overhead side with reducing cooling requirements. And I think there's a great opportunity to turn this generated heat into um, a valuable proposition, which I will get into later on as well. So, oh, one back. Yeah, so a few examples of how this can be done. Um, and those are real examples we have been working on. Um, and uh, the first one is like, um, yeah, basically, how can we create a data center without actually uh, maybe uh, um, yeah, building one from scratch? And the first case I would like to point out is uh, from CoolDC, uh, one of our partners in the UK, uh, Lincoln, uh, where, um, where a normal room is actually being fit out as sort of in an existing building uh, to utilize as a space for high performance computing or any kind of uh, jobs, actually. Um, and this is an award winning data center right now. This space has never been designed as a data center but it's fully uh, designed for liquid cooling purposes, including our technology, allowing for really one of the most sustainable data centers in Europe. Um, so you don't have, uh, you don't need to have a full data center designed from scratch in a very advanced way. If we would look into the campus or the building, your enterprise or your research, uh, research institute is uh, housed in, there are for sure opportunities where we can facilitate um, yeah, your compute based on uh, immersion cooling, right? Um, so what if there's no space, but uh, you, you have maybe greenfield areas on the campus, um, then there are ways to add modular space uh, on campus. We have done so for a French bank, um, actually um, next to their existing data center, uh, which they used to run on a PUE of 1.4. Uh, and uh, um, the facility uh, which you see here on this image, which is a containerized solution, which can be um, yeah, deployed anywhere actually, uh, allows for, to run with a PUE of 1.04. Um, so that's a huge impact. And this can be done as well specifically to, um, to facilitate your uh, HPC, right? Um, as I pointed out, like our solution enables to think uh, not only in uh, scaled solutions, but as well in decentralized solutions, as this also functioning as a standalone system without noise. Um, yeah, one of the cases Boston and Asperitas um, actually are um, in installing at the moment is uh, for a German university where we bring HPC on the department without any uh, data center or server room uh, to bring the compute on premise to the users that need it. Um, so there's also a way where we can decentralize um, HPC for this purpose. And then there's the opportunity, um, I think, uh, what if you still need, let's say, a facility, then um, by combining the energy and the compute proposition, uh, at least we can uh, eliminate the footprint of the data center for HPC, right? And I think this is a real opportunity. Um, especially, um, yeah, being aware that I think quite of the some of the listeners today are probably from the UK. Um, yeah, it was interesting to find out actually that uh, quite some of the universities and research institutes have access to district heating uh, networks in the UK. Uh, more than 30 actually I found, um, according to the Association for Decentralized uh, Energy, uh, which sounds uh, like the right organization to, to ask this from. This is a real time map apparently uh, with the, of the different universities uh, with a district heating network. And that's excellent. Um, so maybe you still uh, will want to have a data center, but uh, running them in an energy neutral way, we can eliminate the footprint of it. Um, as mentioned, our technology is unique in its way to allow for warm water cooling uh, of temperatures of 45 degrees Celsius, um, delivering for 55 degrees Celsius as an output temperature. Um, so in hot climates, this is a free cooling opportunity again. Um, but in regions where it's demand for heat, we can make sure that HPC centers uh, can deliver the heat uh, in an optimal way and, and aim for uh, energy neutrality. Um, so I think this is a great opportunity um, to work on um, if you still want to have a data center, right? Um, so yeah, to close this session, uh, being aware of the time as well, and uh, like that we uh, we um, have some time left to uh, to answer some possible questions. I hope um, I also hope we have been able to share some of the ways that uh, will allow you to focus your attention and your budgets on um, increasing compute power. Uh, wherever required and uh, not necessarily uh, add complex data center facilities, right? Um, I think the right technology choice will allow you to standardize and simplify um, efficiency, performance and sustainability anywhere. Um, and there's a great opportunity um, to bring HPC into enterprise, telecom and industry edge locations. 
Um, that's basically what we have been talking about in the last uh, yeah, 15 minutes or so, right? Um, I think with Boston's track record on bringing advanced compute solutions to the market, and as far as um, our award-winning immersion cooling uh, technology as, as a core technology, we can support you in different regions um, in the world. And uh, having this said, I will uh, leave the floor to, uh, to Mas, I guess, to, uh, to moderate any questions you might have. Thanks, Michael. Um, I've been really fortunate to see the AIC24 in action. And um, for us, when we've taken it to trade shows, it really is a game changer. And um, for Boston, you know, it helps us achieve those green technology targets as well um, as lowering those data center calling costs. So that I think is if there's such a good business case for this, um, which is why um, we definitely um, want to make sure that people get to see this um, either in person when, you know, restrictions are lifted or um, um, we can do um, a digital tour, is that right? Yeah, definitely. So um, as I pointed out, uh, Cool DC is actually a great case, uh, Mars, and uh, they have as well a demonstration system of ours. Uh, so uh, you will be able to experience uh, our technology live. Of course, we have our own lab in Amsterdam as well for, um, for the people on the continent or passing by Amsterdam, maybe on uh, when uh, we're all getting on flights again. And otherwise, what we can facilitate are live demos from the lab to showcase the technology and as well tailored to uh, specific questions or topics uh, our uh, listeners would like to address. Uh, Perfect. So this is now our Q&A session. Um, you can still submit some questions um, by using um, the little um, question mark icon at the top of your screen. We've already had a few through, so I'm just going to get on and start firing them um, at Taylor and Michael. Um, so Michael, first of all, um, what hardware can be used in these systems? And um, this is maybe one for Taylor. And how is warranty affected by immersion? Yeah, maybe I'll start and then pass it on to Taylor. Um, I just would like to point out that um, we make use of standard components in our technology, right? So we work with the solutions um, everyone is uh, is used to uh, to work with. Um, what we do have is an, is an process and uh, we work with that as well uh, with different OEMs as well in collaboration with Boston, of course, uh, in certifying and optimized solutions uh, specifically for immersion. Uh, we truly believe there's a lot of potential for the technology if uh, if we optimize hardware as well for its purpose. Uh, but uh, at least we would like to um, um, uh, certify the reliability of it. Um, so for that purpose, uh, as you know, we work closely together to offer that to customers. Yeah, and just to lead on from that, uh, Boston uh, over the years has developed uh, uh, a warranty, a full comprehensive warranty service to support um, all of our customers who have deployed uh, fully immersion solutions with uh, Asperitas. Uh, so that's something that you can, we can provide directly um, for you. Okay, um, the next question, this is from Yaroslaw. Um, have you considered centralized management to provide clustered HPC machines? That's a very specific question. I'm not sure if that's that's one for me, actually. Um, that's probably something more for our users. Um, we're just a solution provider, right? Maybe there's something for Taylor more. Yeah, I think there's a, there's a, a number of uh, management options when it comes to um, looking at uh, HPC clusters, and it's something that um, forms part of our our, our process. Uh, as I as I spoke about before, where you know while we're building a solution, then it's also comes down to okay, how do we scale this, and and how do we what is the approach uh, for management, and how uh, the ease of that ease of that management um of that entire in environment so that's something that we could uh, probably take off take offline and follow up with some of our uh, our hbc team uh, and we can kind of dev delve deeper into the management options fantastic um what are your ideas to um reuse wasted heat yeah, I think that that's one probably for me. I think, um, yeah, we pointed out already at least one. Um, I think there's a huge opportunity to see um, if there's an access to district heating, right? Um, because like that, you can uh, you can as well, uh, yeah, um, offer some uh, some reduction in footprint for this uh, for this district heating as well, and for the whole environment. 
Um, so it's a two-sided benefit. There's well other ways, um, and we have a whole white paper actually on that on our website uh, called the Data Center of the Future, where we have listed several um, applications of, uh, of making use of heat. And um, the bottom line is there are many more applications than you might think, even in climates uh, where you might not expect to use it for residential needs, for example. Uh, but a lot of industries need heat as well, uh, from breweries, um, but as well uh, facilities like hotels or swimming pools. Um, and uh, labs definitely. So there are definitely um, uh, opportunities, especially I would say on uh, research campuses and uh, part of large enterprise campuses or industrial sites. And um, we've had another question that kind of follows on from that. Um, this is one I would say probably, well, it's probably for both of you really, but who is actually using this technology in real life? Um, they saw the reference to Shell earlier. All ah, right. Yeah. So from something I can share at least is that um, we, we have covered so far different applications. Um, um, cloud providers um, in the UK, um, a bank in France, uh, to give an example. Uh, as you know, um, together we're working on an installation in Germany for a university. Um, so we have seen different users, um, uh, telecom as well. Um, as I said, like our solution actually doesn't change depending on uh, on the application, and uh, that's where Boston really comes in to integrate the whole proposition uh, per application, so that might differ from purely HPC or cloud or enterprise. Um, but um, yes, yeah, so what I can point out is that we, we really standardize uh, the whole proposition, uh, so efficiency and performance for any application anywhere, right? And that's the interesting bit, I think, where this collaboration comes in to see, um, yeah, what are the, the best propositions we can bring forward for different users. We've um, got a few questions that are coming in around the type of fluid that's being used. Um, is it water? What is it? <laughs> yeah, good question. There's always the confusion when uh, people, when they see it for the first time. Uh, it's a very transparent um, fluid, of course, so it, it might look as, as water. And somehow our brains have uh, problems um, yeah, uh, with managing other fluids that are transparent. We translate it naturally to, uh, to water. Uh, it's a synthetic fluid. Um, as I pointed out, Shell produced this uh, in collaboration with us. Um, they have a lot of expertise on fluid developments. Um, they as well developers of uh, well-known um, electric vehicle fluids, for example. Um, so uh, yeah, they are a strategic partner for this. Um, in this case, it's um, it's uh, one misconception I would like to take away right away. Um, it's not mineral oil. It's really a synthetic fluid uh, produced from a gas to liquid principle um, and as well optimized and designed for this purpose. So with our feedback, it's optimal for natural convection, for the performance, uh, for climate independence in high temperatures uh, and very safe, of course. And that's the main benefit from uh, for designing uh, an immersion connecting uh, product for purpose is that it's um, is being certified for safety and um, and having all of course uh, all the compliance documents for it as well. Uh, very important for most enterprise and public organizations. And um, of course, I know this will sort of depend on um, the kind of um, you know uh, hardware that you've got in the unit. But um, we've got a question around what is the planned power of one unit? Um, yeah, that's a really good question that could lead up to another, I would say, um, uh, webinar because there are so many options, as you pointed out, um, uh, Maas. Uh, it really depends on um, yeah what's being used uh, inside our systems. Um, so we have a capability to, um, um, yeah, in average, I think so far as well with the solutions we brought to the market with you guys, uh, I think I believe the maximum um, uh, we saw in the 15-inch system was about 20 kilowatts. Um, but that's just based on what we were able to fit in the system, right? Not about the power or the cooling capability. Um, so um, let's take an, let's, um, a max of uh, 35 to 40 kilowatts per system is feasible, especially the larger system. Um, it's more likely that we uh, can't reach the limits of the system with the physical space that's available uh, within. And that's actually one of the reasons we brought this larger system to the market to allow for more IT. Um, so yeah, natural convection is, uh, is really capable of, um, of allowing for a high density um, and system as well. OK, and I've got two, two more questions. Um, is the liquid non-toxic? important if you're the person that's in charge of uh, uh, putting the sleds in and taking them out and maintaining them? 
<laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, yes, it's non-toxic, toxic, so it's, uh, it's very safe to, to handle as well. Um, and actually, yeah, now uh, covering this topic specifically, um, I would like to mention that there is an, uh, an extended presentation on the Asperger's website on the fluid by shell, which might be very helpful. Um, but one uh, thing I would like to point out is that uh, the fluid, uh, when we were developing it together with Shell, one of the requirements uh, we shared was that um, the, we would like to have very low evaporation levels, something we have seen in the past with other immersion cooling uh, solutions and fluids uh, where this became an issue. Uh, this fluid has uh, practically no, uh, no evaporation, it's unmeasurable. And uh, this makes it very easy to, uh, to handle, but as well to have it in a room and maintain it. Um, as clean and safe as uh, as we would like it to be. So I've got kind of I've got a couple of questions I'm going to link together in this because um, I, I, I kind of know where you guys are going to go with the response. Um, the first question is how can we convince customers about this technology? And the second question is how about deployment in unusual places? Um, I know that, um, that we've had some other questions about, you know, specific industry case studies. So I'm aware of one that we can't uh, mention straight away, but coming very soon, there's going to be a very interesting case study about um, deployment in unusual places. And I think um, that was going to come about how we can convince people about this technology because of the flexibility that you are not limited to a data center. Yeah, correct, Mas. I think, uh, and uh, of course, I know the case you're referring to. Uh, this is going be, to be really interesting indeed to bring that forward. Um, and like that, there there are quite some cases. I think we actually covered some already in this uh, in this webinar. Different examples uh, of it. Um, but yeah, let's uh, let's challenge the listeners a little bit. If they have specific cases uh, they are thinking of, um, yeah, share them. And uh, we're happy, of course, to to think about uh, specific propositions as well. Um, to, to answer the first question you had as well on how to uh, to convince users for this technology, um, well, we have seen uh, the traditional path right from a proof of concept to uh, a little bit larger uh, scale facilities up to uh, large scale um, uh, technology roadmaps uh, where this technology is embedded in, and and this is what we have seen especially with large enterprises um, yeah, to be key. Um, so yeah, let's start with a with a pilot project and uh, and validate the case for you. Uh, in most cases, what we notice as well that the users will start innovating their own model uh, based on the experience they uh, they are uh, gaining with immersion. Um, and this is when it becomes really interesting uh, when we're as well touching different use cases and applications. Um, yeah, as you said, there's so much flexibility and so much potential in the technology uh, to allow uh, yeah, very different models. Um, yeah, this is when users become really excited about it. And I think there's some quite specific questions around pricing and um, placement. So um, what we will be doing is after the webinar, all of our attendees will receive an email and we will give you the opportunity to um, pose your more specific questions to Michael Taylor um, and the Boston HPC team. So if you have very um, specific hardware requirements, you're working with specific vendors, um, we've had a question about a hardware vendor will not provide you with warranty, all of that we can provide um, you know specific um, feedback on your use case um, after the webinar. Um, so finally um, the question that I want to pose this is for you Taylor is um, we've got Boston we've got Asperitas on the call um, how are you going to buy this you, you know if people are sold on this they want to get to the next stage how do you buy your immersed um, computing solution? Well, I think that's uh, thankfully quite simple and straightforward. Um, get in touch with uh, uh, ourselves. Um, our team is kind of here ready and, uh, and, and waiting to kind of understand um, your, use, your use case and how you potentially want to leverage the, the, te the technology. Um, a lot of the processes that I uh, kind of went through be before is the process that we would um, take them through and to understand the requirements and put together uh, the solution that is compatible um, with uh, with the Asperitas uh, uh, fully immersion solution. Um, so uh, we're here and we're ready um, and uh, we're looking forward to taking uh, taking your call.
Perfect. Thanks very much. Thanks, Michael, Taylor, and of course, to you for joining us today. Um, as I've said, we're going to send you links to all the points we discussed today, as well as information of how to register your interest to test um, the AIC24 solution. Um, this webinar has been part of our ISC digital event, so make sure you check out the Boston blog at boston.co.uk for the latest product announcements, white papers and more. Um, thank you once again for joining us. We hope you will join us again in the future for another webinar. Um, I'm sure we will be doing more with Asperitas. Um, we've had so many questions that have come through um, today that we've definitely got enough content for at least one more, <laughs> if not more than that, uh, webinars in the future. So I hope you stay cool. If you're based in uh, UK and Europe, I'm sure you're enjoying or suffering with the heat, depending on that. Stay cool and we'll see you soon. Thank you.